Hey, what's up guys? My name is Echerno and welcome back to my C++ series. So today we're going to be talking all about macros in C++ and we're just going to have like a basic kind of overview of this. I'm not going to get too deep into this today. We'll have some future episodes where we really dive into specifically like specific scenarios of where macros can help you out and probably some advanced examples as well. But today we're just going to introduce them um, and talk about what they actually are. So what is a C++ macro? Macro is, is such a broad term that you, you could, you may have heard other definitions of what a macro actually is in C++, but what I'm specifically talking about today is, use, is using the preprocessor in C++ to kind of macro-fy certain operations, right? So instead of us manually having to type out some kind of code over and over again, we can use the preprocessor to actually help us automate that in some sense. So if you don't know what the preprocessor is, I did make a video a while back about how the C++ compiler works. That covers that to some extent. So definitely click up there and check that out if you haven't already. But basically when we compile a C++ program, one of the first things that happens is a preprocessor pass occurs in which basically every, every kind of statement that you see in C++ that starts with a hash is known as a preprocessor directive. That gets evaluated and kind of done Right, and then that code gets passed onto the compiler for the actual compilation and all of that stuff. So this preprocessor stage is basically a text editing stage in which we can kind of control what code actually gets fed to the compiler. And that's where macros come in. What we can do is write some kind of macro that basically replaces text in our code with something else, right? So it's basically like going through our code and performing a find and replace. And this doesn't just have to be a flat kind of, just a straight find and replace. It can be a find and replace with kind of parameters and arguments and variables and all of that. So we can actually kind of customize the way that we call that macro will define how, like what it actually expands to. And this can be extremely complicated. We talked about templates recently. And with, t I mean, the thing with that is this is, this is a bit different because this doesn't happen during like templates get evaluated a bit later right? In the actual compilation. This is just the preprocessor and this is pure text like replacing. So there's really like, you can't really, there's nothing you can, there's nothing you can't not replace because it's, it's before everything gets compiled. Right. Um, but what I'm kind of getting at is that there is a lot of stuff that you can actually do here and it can be really simple. It can be really complicated. It can be really annoying. It can be really useful. And the way that you use this because C++ is still such a powerful language, the way that you use this and limit yourself is kind of going to be up to, I guess, your personal opinion and your personal preference. I don't like overusing macros because it, it's very hard for people who read your code for the first time to understand what everything means. And it's just not useful a lot, like a lot of the time. Don't feel with a lot of these C++ features, especially as we get into the more advanced ones, there's a tendency for new programmers to just really, really use them a lot. Um, and I said this in the templates video as well, like that's, you shouldn't be trying to do that, right? Don't feel you have to use every single C++ feature to write your program. Like there's no point. You, that's not how, that's not how, that's not how you write good code, right? You're not trying to show off and write absolutely, just show everyone that you know every single C++ feature out there. You're trying to write good code, I would hope. So just a little kind of precursor to this. Don't feel you have to use all this. Anyway, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ramble on here for hours if we don't get into some code. So let's get into some code and talk about macros and how they work and all that. Okay, so I have a very basic program here. And let's think about creating our first macro. So this stdcn.get is something that when I run my program, what it will actually do is kind of pause the execution over here like this until I hit the enter key and then it actually closes my program. So this line basically waits for some kind of enter key press because it needs to read in a line from the console. What we can do is instead of having to write stdcn.get every single time, we can define a macro that basically just inserts that code in. So the way we do that is we write hash define. Okay, this can be written anywhere, by the way. I'm just choosing to write it up here because it's a sensible place. Let's just say wait, and then we'll define that to be stdcn.get, just like that. And I'm not going to define a semicolon, and I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay, now what we can do is basically get rid of this line and just type in wait followed by a semicolon. Okay, now if I hit F5, you can see we get the exact same result and to keep press closes everything. So what I've basically done is said that whenever you encounter this symbol, right? The word wait, I want you to paste in this code. So 
So what happens is during the pre-process, so during the compilation stage and during the pre-processing stage, this basically gets replaced like that. And that is the code that actually gets sent to the compiler, which is of course what we had before. So you can see how this macro has essentially, as far as our program, the way that our program runs and what our compiler sees and how it gets compiled, identical. Compiler does not see any difference because what we've actually done is we've just changed the way that the text kind of gets generated as it gets sent to the compiler. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so this is stupid. The example I've just shown you, I really hope none of you ever do it because this is not this is not how you use the preprocessor. This is silly. You should write stdcn.get. Absolutely, you should write the actual code because what happens is if this was defined in a different file, right? Then all you would see in this file is kind of just that, right? You wouldn't see that. You would see, just see wait. And what, what on earth does wait mean? Now this requires the programmer to actually look up the wait symbol that you've got somewhere else in your code and be like, ah, oh, I see it's stdcn.get, right? You're not trying to write confusing code. This isn't like some kind of obfuscation competition, I hope. So don't, don't use the preprocessor this way. Anyway, back to this. You might have noticed that I kind of played around with a semicolon. The reason I didn't put a semicolon here is because I wanted to put one here. It kind of makes more sense if you put semicolons here in a sense, right? What you can do is not put a semicolon here. Of course, that causes a syntax error because now the code that we actually have is that, and we do need a semicolon at the end of this statement. And we can just move the semicolon into here and make it part of the macro. Now you can see this looks even weirder. We don't need a semicolon. Um, if we, we can put one here, but this just evaluates to kind of being an empty statement as if it was on another line like this, right? Okay, a few more things. We don't, this isn't just limited to actual statements or, or it, I mean, it can be any code. So it can be this, but it also could be something as trivial as, you know, a curly bracket. And we could call this maybe open curly, right? Open curly. And now what we can do, let's restore our cn.get over here. Now what we can do is replace this with open curly, right? And this is looking ridiculous, but if we compile and run our code, of course it's going to be fine right? Because what it's done is when the preprocessor sees this code, it will replace this open curly word with this bracket like that. And we get a normal program. Again, another example, don't use the preprocessor this way, right? Unless you're trying to write confusing code, in which case, I guess this is a decent example, although you probably wouldn't be calling it open curly anyway. But the point is, this is how the preprocessor works. I'm showing you all this so that you understand how it works. Now let's get into maybe some useful code. So another thing that you can actually do is send parameters in, okay? So suppose that I wanted to basically automate this kind of STD C out, you know, I wanted to basically just write this, right? So I wanted to have hello printing. I didn't want to have to write STD C out. It's a bit awkward to type. Whoops, it's a bit awkward to type because I have to type out these like less than symbols and whatever. It gets a bit annoying. So what I'm going to do is find a macro called log that will basically log something. I've written X over here. And this will kind of expand to std c out x and then end line. And again, I'm not writing a semicolon here because I want to have one in my actual macro. Now I can replace this with log hello like that. And you can probably guess what's going to happen here. When the preprocessor goes through this, it will basically replace log with that, right? And then look at this parameter and you can see x over here. I'm using over here, right? So it's going to copy and paste whatever is in here and just put it over here. And so we basically just end up with this, which is exactly what we want, right? So if I run my code right now, as it is, we will get hello printing to the console. So this is kind of warming up towards where I might use a macro, right? I wouldn't really probably use one with C out in this fashion. However, in more complicated logging systems, if you've got like a game engine or an application or some kind of framework, you are likely to have logging systems that you want to have as macros because the way that the logging kind of is defined may change based on your configuration. So let's take it. Let's take a look at an example of that. We have two configurations right now in our program. We have debug and we have release. Debug mode is useful for debugging, right? That's potentially as we're developing our code, as we're developing our application, we want to actually run it in a way that is not optimized and potentially has extra code in there that will help us 
debug our actual code. And so that we can like, I said not optimized just so that we can like kind of go through breakpoints and actually like, so that the compiler doesn't transform our code too much in, a, in an attempt to optimize it so that we can actually debug it properly as is. So anyway, logging is a great example. In debug mode, we potentially want absolutely everything to be logged. However, in release mode, we definitely don't want that to happen because first of all, maybe release mode is our distribution build, right? That's what we actually distribute. That's what we actually send out to people who aren't developers, to our actual users. We don't want that to be logging for a number of reasons. Maybe we don't want to give out any kind of secret information in those log files or in, in the actual logging. Maybe we're printing something that we don't really want to actually print, right? But also performance. Logging takes time and we definitely don't want to be wasting time logging messages to a console during, you know, a user who doesn't care about that actually like playing a game or using our application. So what, what we might actually want to do is strip all of the logging code from our actual release builds, but keep them in debug builds. And we can actually do that using a macro. So what I can do is if I right click on hello world and hit properties, hello world is the name of my project. I've got debug and release under my configurations. I'm going to go into C++ preprocessor and I'm actually going to define something at the front over here called debug. All right, now this is this may may or may not be defined based on your compiler. It might be like underscore debug or something like that. It may already be defined, but it might not be, which is why I'm showing you guys how to actually define it yourself. I'm actually going to call this something like PR underscore debug. PR is just gonna be two little letters that is like the name of our project. It stands for project in this case, but maybe if I was working on the Sparky game engine, which is a little game engine I wrote, I might be using SP underscore debug just to basically be like, this is my macro, right? So it doesn't kind of, it's like a namespace almost so that it doesn't clash with other macros. So I've defined something in the preprocessor called PR debug and, and in release, I'll save this. I might define something called PR release. Now for this example, we might not need this, but in other examples, you may want to actually have that. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to write a basic if def. If def PR underscore debug, I'm going to basically include this code. Otherwise, so else I'm going to write define log X and I'm actually not gonna put anything there just like that, okay? Now there's plenty wrong with this code which I'll explain in a minute, but that's the basic example. So if PR debug is defined, we're going to include this code. Otherwise we're going to include this code. Now what do you think happens when we have log X like this, a macro like that, and then nothing after it? It's gonna replace it with nothing. So what's actually gonna happen is if PR debug is not defined, you can see Visual Studio is actually highlighting the one that is. So if I just drop this down and change it to release mode, you can see this flips. This is what happens, which means this gets just removed like that, okay? I've literally made it so that in release builds, I am not including certain code in compilation at all, which is awesome because it means that that log message won't get triggered at all. I'm not see outing anything, which means that I get all of that sweet performance back and no log message, beautiful. Let's test this out. So in debug mode, I'm just gonna go back to debug and hit F5. You can see I get the word hello printing to the console, awesome. And then finally, I'm just going to change my configuration to release, not touching the code at all, just change my configuration. Now I hit local windows debugger to run my code. And check this out, I get absolutely nothing printing to the console. So that macro has gone ahead and basically just removed code for me. That's really cool. And that is actually a really good use case that is used in the real world all the time. Now there are certain other ones that we can actually use, again, for debugging purposes, which you might have. Now, actually I did say there was some, some things wrong with this code and I know that sometimes I end up being like, hey, there's plenty wrong with this code, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. So let me just tell you what it is. First of all, I'm using if def. That's not great. What I probably would be doing is something like if PR debug equals one, and then I would actually define PR debug to be an actual value instead of actually, you know, defining it. The thing with like defining is that if you misunderstand something with macros, you can generally define symbols as, as either being, you know, define PR underscore debug or maybe define PR underscore debug one. The benefit of doing it this way means that you can actually just Put it back to zero and you don't have to actually remove the whole symbol by either commenting it or actually removing it so this is a lot more clear and if you write your code this way you can see i can actually control debug pr debug up here now you can also do this of course in the properties by just defining uh in debug defining pr debug to be one like that that's also totally fine and that will mean obviously this overrides that but if i get rid of this code it actually means that we'll include certain code here um which works pretty well 
Uh, the other problem here is that maybe, well, it's not really a problem, but what we also could have done is since I did define PR release, we can do else elif, sorry, elif defined PR release like that. And that would actually be, you know, if release mode is defined, of course, PR and release mode, let me go back to debug mode. Um, then everything would be fine over there. Okay, and I'm actually gonna go back here and fix my mistake. Obviously I've put spaces in here, you can't do that. So let's just leave it like that and hit okay. And there we go, that works just fine. So that's basically, I guess, the same thing that I did before, but just showing you guys another way to do it using if rather than if defined or if def, which is slightly worse in a lot of cases. Anyway, I'm gonna wrap up the video there because that is a pretty basic introduction to macros. Actually, one more thing. With this if thing, what you can do is disable entire blocks of code as well. So I could quickly just say if zero, which means kind of if false, and then wrap some code in that, like that. Now this is now fully inactive, right? Which means of course I get an error in this case, but you can see that we can actually use preprocessor and macros, I guess, to actually get rid of certain things in code. I've got a few more examples that I'm probably gonna show in more videos. There are a lot of things we can do here. We can play around with like string manipulation and we can actually insert different built-in kind of preprocessor symbols such as what like file the statement is actually kind of inserted in, right? And what line of code it's happening in, what function it's in and stuff like that. There's a lot of stuff we can actually do, mostly for debugging purposes. If I have to be completely honest, macros are the most useful for debugging purposes. I also didn't mention that you can use backslashes if you want multi-line macros. In fact, I guess I'll show one more example. What you can do is if you have something like, let's just say this whole main function, I wanna make a macro out of this. I don't have to write it all on one line, just being like, you know, int main and then stdc and whatever that might be annoying. What I can actually do is write int main and then when I actually want another line, I can just add a backslash, which basically escapes the new line character when I hit enter. Then I can write my opening curly bracket, another backslash, and then I'll write my std cn.get, another backslash, and then this. And then I can basically replace this whole thing with main just like that. And if I run my code, you can see that it runs just fine as before and I can just hit enter and everything's great, okay? So the backslashes are basically just escaping this enter key press. It's, it's kind of not feeding in that enter, that new line character into the preprocessor so that, it, so that it actually keeps treating this as part of the same macro. If you didn't have this, then this is just kind of normal code, right? Because macros kind of do have to be on one line, okay? But backslash can prevent that. Make sure you don't have a space after your backslash because then you're actually escaping the space and not the, new, the, not the new line character. So it has to be backslash and then enter straight away. Anyway, hope that kind of explains macros to you. The best way to actually see these in action is to see them in action. So when we start the game engine series and we, uh, I've already used them in the OpenGL series actually, check out the, um, video about OpenGL errors that has some great examples on how to actually use macros. We use one for actually like wrapping every OpenGL function call in a macro so that we can error check it automatically every time we use an OpenGL function. Definitely check that out. That's a real world example of how you might use macros. When we start the game engine series as well, plenty of macros will be used. Don't worry for stuff like memory allocation as well. Um, really useful because Another example here that I might just give right now is memory, with memory allocation in debug builds, we might want to know exactly how many bytes are being allocated from which file and which line of code. So literally like, please tell me, is it coming from main.cpp line 15? I allocated 28 bytes. I want to know that kind of stuff, right? For tracking or for just debugging purposes for whatever. You can actually use a macro to do that if you replace the new keyword with like a custom keyword, which, which will automatically actually track which line, which file and line the allocation came from and how big it was and all of that kind of stuff. So that's another useful kind of use case for macros. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, you can hit that like button. You can also help support these series that I do here on YouTube by going to patreon.com forward slash the channel. Huge thank you as always to everyone who helps support all these videos because they wouldn't be here without all those wonderful supporters. Next time we're going to probably, I might just dive into some more advanced uh, macro kind of examples actually, but there are quite a lot of things that I still need to cover for the C++ series. If you want to see something specific, definitely leave a comment below and I will see you next time. Goodbye.